Welcome to the Lesbian Review Podcast. Today I'm joined by not one but two fantastic reviewers, which means that there are three of us reviewing one book. That's right, that's three reviewers, one book. It's a first for the TLR podcast. And today joining me is April and Tara. Really cool to have you guys on the show. Thank you for joining me, April. Okay, you're welcome, Sheena. I've come to enjoy myself, so hey, why not? Two great women, we talk about books. What could be better than that? <laughs> so true, so true. And Tara, thank you for joining me today. Hooray, I'm, re- I'm happy to be here. So now, Tara, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to ask you to please tell us what the synopsis is for Charming the Vicar by Jenny Frame, which is the book we're talking about today. So, according to this fabulous review that I saw up on (laughs) thelesbianreview.com, you are welcome. (laughs) The face you're making is so good. (sighs) Bridget is the vicar in the small town of Axdale. She also happens to be lesbian, and while being lesbian is fine, you need to be celibate if you want to remain a vicar and be gay. That's fine for Bridget, since the only other single lesbian in town is a good friend of hers, and there's no sexual chemistry between them at all. Bridget's carefully constructed and safe world begins to crack when newcomer Finian Kane rents a cottage in the village. There is something about this master of illusion that draws Bridget to her, despite the devastation that it can cause to her life. Not only is Finn lesbian, but she has spent a lot of her career tearing down religion. Finn is broken after the loss of her sister, and she is trying to escape from the world by hiding out in the small village. Unfortunately, the pesky vicar won't leave her alone, and to make matters worse, the vicar is attractive, and Finn can't stop staring at her legs. Nor can we blame Finn. Before we continue, I just want to say we're going to have spoilers, so if you have not read or listened to this book, bear with us, because there are going to be one or two things that will... Not major spoilers, because frankly this book is not so like, ooh, it's so surprising... So it won't ruin the book for you, but there are a couple of spoilers in it. All right, so let's start off by talking about Jenny Frame's work in general. Jenny Frame tends to write butch femme romances, but what I particularly love about her butch femme romances is that each couple is very different. Not all of her butchers are exactly the same as each other, right? Which I find is a problem in lesbian fiction, and I find it so refreshing that her butch characters are a little bit different every single time. What do you think, April? I think that's a good point you raised there, because remember, butch women don't come like cut out of cardboard, like each pattern one after the other. They have unique differences in butches. There are soft butch, hardcore butch. You have different types. There are butch that love to be dominated. They love to be called boys. They love to be dominated. And then there are butches who don't want to be dominated. They want to be the top, you know. And there are butches who want to be daddies. They want to take on more of a masculine identity alongside their femininity. And I love to see the way the different butches, how they express their sexuality. It's just wonderful. There's no one way to do butch. There's no one way. I agree with you. Tara, what did you think of this particular representation for butch? I really liked it. I felt like it was really different from all of her others, but I'm not sure I can delve into it without talking about the sex, and I don't know if we want to talk about that yet. No. I think, as with all good things, you know, we need a little foreplay first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did I did really like her. I don't know that Finn is my very favorite of her butch characters, because Dale in Unexpected... <sighs> It's just, I just love her so much, but there was a lot that I liked about Finn. She was really complex, and I thought it was really interesting what she did with her in terms of her spirituality and um, her, what a crisis of faith can look like for an atheist, I thought was particularly interesting. Absolutely. Um, I, I absolutely love that side of it as well. April, you brought up an interesting point about um, what did you say? Something to do with spirituality. Yeah, because I thought, right, you can be spiritual and you can be sexual. Why should you have to choose? I mean, someone shouldn't have to choose between the two. You can be a spiritual person and express your sexuality. Now, no one is saying that you're gonna wow all the church members on a Sunday with it, but 
I mean, you shouldn't have to hide the fact that you have a lesbian lover. You can't have a lover and still praise your higher power, you know, in whatever way you choose. And that was a big theme throughout this book, was the was Bridget having to choose between, um, well, not choose, but having to sort of battle this, this war, because as a vicar, she couldn't be an out lesbian and, and she had to be celibate, whereas heterosexual couples did not have to be celibate. They could get married, right? So there was this whole battle and that was kind of Bridget's internal thing. As I kind of loved that because we saw Bridget initially in Courting the Countess and in that I really thought she was a great character, but in this one, Frame really took her in and gave her like layers. Yes. Absolutely. And then I think she really met her match in Finn. And I think it's particularly interesting when you do match this like deeply spiritual vicar with someone who's not only an atheist, but she's actually known as a skeptic. You know, she does the kind of work that Penn and Teller do in terms of debunking, well, like religious quacks and other things like that. And so If Bridget wanted to make the case for gay clergy to have partners, she could not have picked a worse partner. (laughs) And yet they work so well. And there's something beautiful about seeing Finn come around to it too. And, you know, I'm a person who did come from religion. So I, you know, I really engaged with that side of it in a way that I may not have before because I grew up in an evangelical home and then probably about five years or so ago was kind of when I left the church and so it was interesting to see the crisis of faith go the opposite way from I've believed all my life in this religion and this doesn't feel right anymore to actually I didn't think there was anything I've said there was nothing I've gone on record I've gone on television and said there's nothing But oh my god, what if there actually is something? And I thought that was a really interesting twist on the crisis of faith that we've seen in all kinds of media. I agree with you, Tara. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's not, as you said, she could not have picked a loose partner, but look at how beautiful it turned out. Because here she was blasting it all out there, saying, no, there is no God, and showing people up. And it's not like she wasn't someone who wasn't known. Everybody knew about her. And for her to go with Bridget and the whole church coming down on her back, oh my God, this atheist is going to change you, going to change the face of our church, everything. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Oh yeah. It's a club. She, she had a lot of ovaries to go there. Yep, a lot of ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> and how lovely was it that the town protected Finn? Like they recognized that she needed a break and she needed to get away. And I just love Axdale. Like I want to go and hang out there and have some snacks and some tea with the people. Help Quaid find a girlfriend because Quaid needs a girlfriend. I hope they find a girlfriend for Quaid really soon because I everybody's getting love. Quaid needs some too. I mean, a rugged butch farmer. Hey, hey, that's sexy as hell. She needs she needs a partner. I asked Frame about that, and she says, "Look out for for Quaid's romance in 2019." Aww. Yay! I got a whole year to wait for this. <laughs> um, what are your pros? What is the best thing about this book for you guys? Well, my pros would be this. I really love the fact that at the end of the day, the other people in the clergy, they came together and banded together to protect Bridget from losing her spot in the vicarage there in Axdale because the rest of them were going to come out. They say, okay, you're going to put her out because she wants to fall in love and be with this person. Then we're all going to come out. We're all going to spill all the church secrets. We are all gay. And now they were like, oh my God, this is going to cause a rift in the church. Let's, let's try to accommodate Bridget. Let's try to do this, that, the other. But my thing about it is it should not have had to reach that point. You know what I mean? But I'm so glad they still banded around her, even though those who were retired and all of those stuff, they came together and showed LGBT solidarity. And that's what I thought was a proof for me. So the spirituality storyline was really a strong attraction for you, April. Yes, it was, because I was raised as Catholic. And, you know, when I first realized, oh, my God, gay, gay. But 
the Bible said and this and that. And I was like, oh my God, what are you going to do? You're living in a country named Trinidad and Tobago where being gay already is illegal. So you are illegal in your own country. What the hell are you going to do? You come from a Catholic thing where guilt is your everyday supper, dinner, breakfast. How are you going to even go now to confession and say, hey, I love another woman. What what am I going to do then? And at, at one point in time, I had to reconcile the fact that, hey, God made me as I am. He doesn't make mistakes. Why should I see myself as an aberration? You know, as something perverted. I'm not perverted. If God made different color flowers, he made different races, then he's going to make different sexualities. There's not going to be one staple, okay, we're all heteronormative. Everybody's straight. It can't be. Because if there's differences and variations throughout nature, throughout plant life, throughout everything, you can't expect sexuality not to be varied and fluid. You know? Well said. I wasn't brought up uh, religious myself. I'm agnostic, if anything. And like it was, it was cool to see that sort of side of it. But my biggest pro was that this book was so very different in storyline and tone to Courting the Countess. I was really worried that Frame would try and kind of copy the success of that. It's still my favorite Frame book, Courting the Countess, but it was such a, a huge success that I was concerned that she'd want to kind of duplicate it or, or, or it would naturally happen. And I'm so glad it didn't. This book stands on its own. The characters are strong. The storyline is completely different. And I love that there's a BDSM twist. So for me, that was my biggest pro. Tara? I think for me, it was the character work. And more specifically, it was Bridget's character. Because I also adored Courting the Countess, which of course is all your fault because you talked to me about it on a podcast. And then I listened to it and I fell in love with it. And ah, one of the best gifts you gave me in 2017. And I loved Bridget. She was one of my favorite, she was probably my favorite side character and I was so excited when I heard that she was getting a book. And then when we got her backstory, there was so much more to her than I would have guessed. Like, yeah, I knew she was this like super sexy vicar, but it was really interesting to see that, oh, she's actually from a wealthy family and her mother is a celebrity and, oh... She has this past as Mistress Black, does she? <laughs> and even so, like, wow, that was a really interesting backstory. I love the journey that she went on as well. Like, both she and Finn have these really rich character arcs. And I appreciate as well that it's not just molding them so that they can f become the right shapes to be in a relationship with each other. It's actually character arcs that make them better for themselves so that they can actually be their most authentic selves in a way that they weren't able to be before. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think she dug deeper in her character work for this book than I've seen her do before. And I was really impressed. And then I'm going to tack on another pro because I always add things and I can't help myself. <laughs> and I don't want this to get missed, but the narration for this book is fabulous. I think Nicola Victoria Vincent is just, for me, I can't imagine anyone else reading Jenny Frame's books at this point, especially books that take place in the English countryside. She does a great job on all the characters. She differentiates them well. She does the men's voice as well. Um, and so now when I listen to it, I just, I know I'm an Axdale. It feels good and it makes me happy. Uh, I feel so conflicted because I agree with you about Nicola Victoria Vincent entirely. But I I am concerned. I'm I'm very happy for you to continue narrating all the Axdale books, but I'm concerned about her continuing to narrate all of Frame's books because I want to see differentiation coming out of the British lesbic sector. And she's like the only narrator just about at the moment. You know, and I, I love you. her. I love her. But I want to see the sector grow. If Jenny Frame writes older characters, she should, or Bold Strokes, I guess, because they're the ones who produce their own audiobooks, should get the same woman who narrated Seasons of Love by Harper Bliss. Because she's British, and she was fabulous. And she has this, like, super sexy, older, really rich voice. Okay. But that's it. 
I don't think I I'm trying to think right now if there's any other I've heard one or two other ones but but I really like um because bold strokes dominates the audiobook market at the moment I'm hearing more from them and therefore their main narrators I'm hearing again and again and again and it's not that I don't like the narrators I just I just want to see it growing that's all well, I understand what you mean. You probably want to hear different voices. You want to see other people coming up so that every time you put out a review for an audiobook, you could put a different name as the narrator and you could critique the different person's voice and all of that instead of it just being one person because there's only so much you can talk about one person. That is definitely one of the, the things. All right, so let's talk cons. April, what's your biggest con for this book? My biggest con is the fact that Okay, the church accept, finally relented and accepted, you know, Bridget and Finn's relationship. But the thing is, she had to keep it on the down low. It's almost like if she has to hide the fact that she is in a relationship to keep her job as, a, as you know. And I didn't agree with that because I think if it's okay for their straight counterparts to get married and have their relationship out in the open, it should be the same for her. She should be able to go in front of a priest in her same organization, put a ring on Finn's finger and said, I do, you know, and let everybody know. It shouldn't be a secret because closet are for clothes, you know. It shouldn't be for a human being to fit into because a closet is a really uncomfortable and stuffy place. And hey, I know how choking that feels, you know, if you like a gasping for air in that closet put little punch holes in it there for you to breathe through, but, I mean, come on. You know, I just find that was the injustice there. I think that she should have been able to get married, and I think the church should have come to an agreement to say, yes, let us let the gay and lesbian community get married, you know? Unfortunately, we live in a society, though, where that isn't always the case, and you are super aware of that. I mean, still today, yeah, we, we have spaces in the world where it's illegal, where people are literally being killed for it, or being imprisoned yeah. for it. I think our literature is going to reflect that for as long as it's still relevant to society, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. I was just disappointed that, you know, the being there in England where, you know, being LGBT isn't a crime anymore. I thought that they would have allowed Bridget and Finn to get married, you know? Not just riding off with the girl into the sunset, but I got you, but I still have to hide you, you know? So that was my con. But I think in the end, they were okay coming out, weren't they? Yeah, they were okay coming out. But I just wanted it to be equal now with the straight counterparts. They should have had the equality because Bridget is a really great vicar. She goes up above and beyond, and I thought that was really unfair. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Tara, what was your biggest con? All right. It is also tied to the sex. Are we able to talk about the sex yet? please please sure we can talk about the sex have we had enough foreplay <laughs> never Tara we never have enough foreplay that's the thing we're women <laughs> okay Hi. exactly alright let's talk about so, sex so first I'm gonna say the sex is not a con Jenny Frame writes great sex scenes um, so just to make that very clear the con for me was that I thought this was going to be a BDSM, rom like erotic romance. And while there was, there, there was some power play to what was happening between Bridget and Finn in the bedroom, it really, like, it's a contemporary romance. It's not an erotic romance. So if you think you're picking up an erotic romance with a lot of actual like BDSM play in it, this is not going to be the book for you. Was the sex that was there great? Yes. It just wasn't what I expected. So I think it's, it's still, it's still good. And I mean, it, it is interesting to kind of see into the psyche of the former dominatrix and, and I liked to get back to the thing that I liked about, Finn's butchness I liked getting to see a butch bottom because that's not something we get to see a lot of in lesfic usually if there's a butch woman in there she's topping the femme and so it was really great to see that and how Finn was very happy to submit um, and not only happy but like sought it out so 
those are all my thoughts in one bucket. Please enjoy. <laughs> yeah, my con was was that if you're expecting a BDSM novel, because they talk about Mistress Black in the teasers, I think, in the like synopsis and stuff, you're getting a BDSM light. So you're getting like a beginner intro to BDSM, uh, you know, for the happy housewife. So, but that's cool. I'm actually, I was very happy with BDSM light because I... I'm not that into erotic stuff. By and large, I want my romance to be a romance with some cool sex, if it has to have sex. I want my erotica to be erotica and on a different bookshelf. For me, that wasn't really a con. It was just like a heads up to people expecting a a more BDSM-centered sex thing. And interestingly enough, so while that was a heads up for some people, I spoke to somebody who read this book and didn't like it because of the sex. Because she was uncomfortable with the BDSM in terms of the boy, because Bridget calls Finn boy, right? And that whole power play thing. And she didn't like that at all. She felt it was... um, Like demeaning? Yes. Like taking away the butcher's power. Oh, see, I liked that. And I thought it worked really well. And it's like the slightest of nods towards age play but without actually getting into it at all, because it's not like a mommy boy thing. Like Bridget didn't set herself up as a mommy. Thank God. <laughs> that would have been a very different book. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I can only think of one age play erotic romance in Lesfic, and that's At Her Feet by Rebecca Weatherspoon. And it's really well done and it's not creepy, which you would think it would be. Um, but I don't know. I thought it fit for Bridget and Finn. Like, it just fit for them so well. That was... April, what's your take on this? Uh, my take on it is that I like how Bridget and Finn, they complimented each other because here it is, Bridget is a femme fatale. She's a femme top. She gets off on being in charge. And Finn, no, Finn was always put into a rule You know, because other people expected her to be the top because she's butch. And there are times when people who are accustomed to being in charge like to just let go of all responsibility and just be themselves and be dominated. We see that time and time again. So it wasn't a demeaning, it wasn't a taking of power, it was a sharing of power. And I think some people get tied up with the whole king aspect. They think that it is tied up. <laughs> yep, tied up. Yeah, because they think it's embarrassing. They think it is you have to give over everything. Remember they see some people see the submissive as weak and they see the top as the dominant as strong. But what they don't consider is that it takes a very strong mind to switch rules, to switch from being in charge to submissive. And a a sub can be weak. It can be a weak sub because you have to submit to this person, you have to get in and out of a rule at a moment's whim. And for the top now, the top feeds off of the submissive power. So a lot of times, people think in this king life that, okay, hey, that that being at the bottom is demeaning, I'm going to be degraded. No, you're not going to be degraded. It's a sharing of power. If you're not comfortable with something, you have a safe word. And I love the fact that this other book, A.J. Shippers, she wrote with Shadow Haven. That was a really good book. And I love how both women shared power. And if you're not comfortable with something, you didn't have to do it. And that's it to me because I don't think it's demeaning and I don't think it's degrading. It's up to the both parties. You know, many times you always see the top in charge. And sometimes the top, the butch, they don't always want to be in charge. Sometimes it's really a great turn on to see a femme woman taking charge, taking the reins or the whip. Who knows? <laughs> Well said, April. <laughs> I love the, the tied up thing. That was funny. Okay, but I agree with you. Would you recommend this book as a must read? And who do you think would enjoy the book the most? Like what kind of reader? Someone who's into like light BDSM might enjoy this book because it gives you a lot of background into the characters and into other books. It gives you a lovely countryside. It gives you beautiful relatable down to the personalities i mean they're dealing with problems and issues that mainstream people we all deal with if they deal with religion they deal with okay is it okay to be kinky is it okay to submit you know 
questions like that. So if you're looking for like a light king read with a lovely storyline in the background that really takes up most of the story because the sex is not the beginning and end all of the story. It fits in, it ties in so well into the whole tapestry of the story. So if you're looking for a light read like that, sure, no problem, but this book is not going to be as Tara said. The erotica is not going to dominate the book. The erotica fits into the book, but it's not going to dominate it. So, <laughs> so, so, so I would recommend this book to a reader who does not want hardcore kink. They want like a nice, soft, light read with a little erotica thrown in. This is for them. If they want harder books with more kink or more sex or more power play, they could read books like Shadow Haven right by A.J. Shippers or At Her Feet by Rebecca Weatherspoon because I read that book as well and that book it fit in really nice. There are books with these lines that people love. Not everybody's gonna love hardcore kink and stuff and not everybody's gonna love you know the softer kink like this but this is for anyone who really appreciates a book with developed characters beautiful storyline where sex doesn't dominate and take up the whole book. <laughs> sex actually only happens towards the end of the book for the first time and when when it does happen, I was very surprised, actually. It took me by surprise that she was going there. But having said that, I shouldn't have been surprised because I've read Jenny Frame's books and she loves to have strap-ons at play. That's actually quite a big part of the sex in this book. So if you're not a huge fan of penetrative sex in lesbic, skip ahead. Because, um, you know, at some point, uh, Les Fick, it was a big no-no to have any penetrative sex in it. Yeah, because I heard the old cry a lot of times when people said, okay, you want to have strap on and sex, oh my god, you're mimicking, you know, the male-female thing. And I don't think so. I think they put too much emphasis on shaming the acts of sex. There is no one right way or wrong way to do lesbian sex. It comes like you're telling me, okay, there's only one way to be a lesbian. There's not only one way to love women. You have a whole lot of ways to love women. Women have a whole bountiful stuff. Look look at a woman. She's born with breasts. That's a fun fact. She's born with a neck to kiss. She's born with a lovely belly button. And when we go south, there's a lot of stuff to treat her with there. But the thing is, strap on sex, penetrative sex, all of that. <laughs> she is funny. <laughs> This topic is hot. <laughs> I think all of this, there's no one way, you know? Penetration when I strap on, that's not a big deal. Hell, they have big sex toys there. There are big books there with whole lesbian sex book. I don't know if y'all know about it, but there's a big book called The Whole Lesbian Sex Book by Felice Newman. Hey, that is a textbook that I got as a gift, a birthday gift from a best friend. It was a thick book about 900 pages and i'm there devouring this book when i first found myself i'm like wait they do all of this i'm like wow and i was like because before we have a small lesbian community here in trinidad and everybody's talking about this is wrong that is wrong i'm like hey you all realize you all are saying certain things are wrong and we are wrong to society to general society we are wrong and man when i started reading this book i debunked all the shame and stuff i ever heard about i like Look, my whole life has been a lie. Strap on sex is okay. It's still a woman making love to me. What the hell are they talking about? <laughs> what is wrong with having email play this, that, the other? All of that was in the book. All the big taboo stuff that I was taught to feel guilty about, I threw it out the window. I'm like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> that sounds like a good friend. Yeah, she sent it for me on my birthday. I never forgot that. When that saw sent that book, my eye opened wide like a saucer because it was wrapped in brown paper. And when I uncovered this book, and it was from Police Press, and I opened this book, I was like, oh my God, there's a naked woman on the cover. And I'm there hiding it, but it was me alone home. What was I doing hiding? <laughs> but it's so ingrained in you to hide stuff and be ashamed that it's like, I peeping around the cover of the book and they had images in the book with strap ones. I'm like, oh my god, there's stores that sell this? Going online to see and it's like, what is the big deal? Now I can look back and laugh 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I'm feeling ashamed to open this book. It's like, oh my god, it's got all I wanted to know. And there it is. Oh well, now I no longer blush. <laughs> yes, it's an amazing book. Anytime you look it up with please press books, it, it wowed me, the whole lesbian sex book. <laughs> it just wowed me. When you first came out and you don't know what the hell you're doing, and it's like, okay, what the hell am I really going to do? And then and I this book and I read it, I had a good laugh at myself. I must admit, I did. 
So, I mean, that's useful because it's like, hey, honey, today, today we're doing page 33. <laughs> oh, how you mean? I pulled out that book really well when I got in my first real relationship. I'm like, hey, hey, are we going to try any of this stuff here? And they're like, oh my God, April, so this is why you're not blushing about anything I brought up. Nope, I'm no longer blushing. I do all my blushing when I first read it. Now it's your turn. <laughs> I kind of love this. I think we need to give you a sex talk show, April. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh my God, no. And there was one point in time I thought, hey, I'd have become a sex therapist. And I was like, but then I'm going to be hearing about all kinds of stories. Hmm. Would, how would I keep my face straight when I'm talking about these things? <laughs> Tara, did you know about this massive sex book? Did you know this thing exists? Um, I didn't know it existed, so I got it. I didn't know that this specific one existed, but I'm not surprised. I mean, there's there's guides to every kind of sex. Why wouldn't there be one for this? That does make sense. I suppose it's the kind of thing where, like... It also wouldn't be particularly useful to me. Like, I am married to a dude... So let's let's veer back away from April's sex life, back to the topic at hand, <laughs> Charming the Vicar. All right, so Charming the Vicar was a follow-up to Courting the Countess. Do you think it was a worthwhile follow-up? Yes. I definitely think so. Do you think it was better than Courting the Countess? That's not a fair question. Yeah, she now she you are not being fair. You're not being fair, Tara. You agree with me, right? Yeah, I do. I think it's hard to compare. I do think that I enjoyed courting the Countess a little more because I love Annie very much, as has been documented in probably at least two other podcasts at this point. But I. Th- I enjoy Courting the Countess more. I love Courting the Countess more. I think Charming the Vicar is a better book. It has better character work. And it deals with more difficult and interesting themes. Mm, That's an interesting take on it. What do you think, April? It's a really hard choice to me. Yes, I really love Courting the Countess because that was the first Jenny Frame book I've ever read, Courting the Countess. And boy, is it really hard to choose between that and Charming the Vicar. But after Agree Tara, there's a lot more character development in this other book. And I just love the switch of the dynamic. It doesn't follow a pattern. I just love the switch up and the dynamic. I love both books equally. So I cannot choose which one I love more. I love Court and the Countess for it being my first at Jenny Frame. I love it for the lovely butch characters, especially Harry. I'm not going to fan her. I'm not going to go down there. And I still love Finn and Bridget. I just love a woman in heels too when they're ready. But come on, I really love my butchers. So I uh, think I might still hold tight to Court in the Countess. I still hold tight to that. But I love Charm and Ibeka as well. What about you, Sheena? Um, I don't think it's a fake question, Tara. <laughs> you <laughs> bad person. <laughs> Quoting the Countess will always be my first love, Jenny Frame. It doesn't matter what else she writes. I just fell in love with that book. I've listened to Quoting the Countess on repeat. Like, I've listened to it in a loop because I've just loved it that much. So it's not actually fair to compare it to any other book because I just love it that much. Charming the Vic is an excellent read. It's an excellent audio book. It's a really good book. I love that she did such different things with this one to any of her other works. And I just love Jenny Frame's writing and every single story she gets stronger and stronger as a writer. So, yes, technically this is probably a better book, but there's something about Courting the Countess, the magic spark that holds my heart. See, I knew I was right. I was not the only one. This is a great book, though. I'm a, you know. Okay, so if people love Charming the Vicar, what else should they be listening to? Or reading. I just love English books with a lovely countryside feel. I just love any book that goes down that route. And I love Jenny Frame's book. And then I love, Lord, yes, the other day I was fangling about Jerry Hill and some of her books with that lovely countryside kind of feel. So I would recommend some of Jerry Hill's books like The Cottage, Secret Pond. So 
that one is another book that they could look at. What about you, Tara? So, if you want that small town British kind of feel, because this book, I have a few different recommendations because this book has a few different elements that you can't actually all find together in any one other book. So if you want that British small town feel, then I would recommend Poppy Jenkins by Claire Ashton. Even though it's in Wales, it's not in England, but it has that like fabulous, very, it is a very small town with lovely quirky characters, beautiful romance. You cannot go wrong with that book. If you want, if you want just an excellent BDSM romance, and you can get this on audio, you should get The Night Off by Megan O'Brien. It's narrated by Alexandra Wilde. It's so good. It's probably the best one. And if you want another erotic read that's a lot, well, it's a lot angstier, but it's so much fun, then I'd recommend French Kissing by Harper Bliss. The first season in particular is super erotic, and it has a similar... Like, there's kink there, but it is kind of more in the kink light rather than uh, a really heavy kink to it. Um, and it's in audio with Abby Creighton narrating it, and she does a fabulous job. I'm listening to season three right now. I am in love with this series. <laughs> I highly recommend it, especially in audio. Okay. I find it really difficult to recommend books for Jenny Frame if you enjoyed this read this because I find that Jenny Frame has such a unique voice in Les Fix. She, she is doing things that no other authors are doing. She's got a particular tone that nobody else is really doing. Her butch femme combinations, even other writers who are doing butch femme are not doing it the way Jenny Frame is doing it. So I'm finding she's, if you, if you like Jenny Frame, just read Jenny Frame. That's kind of my, my philosophy on the matter. She's got a bunch of books out. Royal Rebel is, is, Quite a fun one. The whole Royal series is is also fun. Go look her up. Go read her other books. Yeah, I agree with you there, Sheena, because she doesn't follow a particular formula. She just does her thing. And she comes out with books that, I mean, you are like, wow, she's actually talking about the butch bean at the bottom. I mean, and she's putting it in a way to give power to both parties. Hey, Jenny Frame, she has my vote there. As you said, like Jenny Frame, read all her stuff. Get all her books. Because, I mean, I have not come across another writer, another lesbian writer like her, who will write outside of the box and break all kinds of convention and still produce a beautiful book at the same time. She's also got a very unique way that she tells stories, which I particularly like, that I'm not finding in in lesbian. And, and the thing about that is, is it's so wonderful because um, the greats do it. You know, Radcliffe, you pick up a Radcliffe book, you know this is Radcliffe. Nobody writes quite like her. Melissa Braden, she's got that light, fluffy kind of Hollywood sort of thing going, which nobody else quite gets. Jenny Frame is also like that. She's got a very unique something about her her writing. So it's it's wonderful to pick up, but very difficult to recommend if you enjoy this, you know, try this other author. It's so true, because her topics are going to span a wide range of other writers, because she does the BDSM, she does the strap-on sex, she does everything, butch femme, you know, she does it all. So you're not going to be able to recommend one book to pinpoint who. She's she's an author who has, she's like an ice cream tub with lots of fa- flavors swirling around in it. She's got too many flavors for one spoon. You can't pin her down anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and yet she's del- delightfully creamy. Yes, and delicious. The stories are delicious. <laughs> Sheena, I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm innocent. I'm, you there. <laughs> I'm innocent. Why? why? Uh-huh. That halo slipped off a long while ago. <laughs> All right, so is there anything else you guys want to add that we've missed out? I don't think we've missed out anything. I think we've touched on spirituality, pros, cons. We've talked about sex. Hmm, lots of sex. <laughs> ah, and we had a lot of foreplay, and then we even delved into my sex life. Oh my God, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> I think you were you were pretty uh, happy to share that. <laughs> You're a wild woman. So there's one there's one thing I want to talk about actually, and that's legs. Right? Mm-hmm. 
Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. in this, I find it absolutely adorable that Finn can't stop staring at Bridget's legs, which is such a cute theory element that can go so very wrong. <laughs> okay, so, I've read books before where authors have added in, like, a funny uh, character quirk. Okay, but then they just overdo it, and eventually it's like, oh my god, is she looking at, is she doing this again? Please somebody stop her. I found in this book that it just added to Finn's character, and didn't make it obnoxious, and didn't overdo it, and it was really nicely done. And it's not something that happens often in Frame's books, so it's not like, (laughs) it's not like every book has got, you know, leg mentions, or whatever it is. It's very unique to this particular book and this particular character. What did you guys think of that? I thought it was cool because she just went there with that whole leg thing. And I love how it's almost like if Finn, she put Finn with a kind of fetish for like from her toes come straight up her legs. And she wears these boots, these leather boots. So it's like you're capturing the whole of Mistress Black. So that those legs, those legs that go on forever in Jenny Freeman's kind of way of putting it gives me a kind of bird's eye image of what she really looks like she's planting that image of Bridget in my mind. Tall, knee-high, black leather boots coming right up those slim, nicely shaved legs. But it gives you a beautiful, it gives you a eye candy there. <laughs> okay, so while we give you a minute to cool off, April, <laughs> what do you think, Tara? Yeah, I agree. I like that it was very much a part of Finn. It's not just a thing that comes up in book after book and I think it also they did some fun things with that and Finn's submission I I liked how how frame tied that in and it also kind of just made me want to see her legs too if I'm being honest I would like to see Bridget and those legs Mm-hmm. in a short skirt or whatever she decides to wear is up to her. I don't think anybody tells her what to do. Alrighty. So while I let the two of you steam off, like I'm going to <laughs> to call that timeout. Okay. Time out. You asked. <laughs> I know. I don't know what's wrong with me. You've been listening to the Lesbian Review podcast today. I've been joined by Tara and April. You can find their reviews on the Lesbian Review website. You can also come and talk to us in the Lesbian Review Book Club on Facebook. Thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yes, we are happy to share all of this with you. Bye. Bye. Bye.